visual of our community's diversity that the park presents. There was a baseball game happening, no organized sport with look-alike shirts, but just a group of young neighborhood kids, African American, Caucasian, Hispanic, and Asian. They were playing their game. I watched as one short child hung back quite a ways behind the batter's box. After several batters, the pitcher yelled for all to hear, hey, that kid, pointing behind the batter's box. Hey, that kid should have a turn at bat. I watched the smile on the invitee's face as he stepped up and took the bat in his hand. Now I ask you to bow your heads in prayer. Loving God, we rejoice in the diversity of our community. We rejoice in the children of our community. We ask for your spirit of wisdom and hope as we make decisions for this community and for our children. We ask for your spirit of wisdom and hope in a special way these days as we choose a new police chief. We ask that as leaders, we may work to take the example the children gave us, playing, working together, and noticing the one who needed special encouragement to take part. May we be mindful of offering this invitation to participate to everyone. And finally, Lord, tonight, we ask for your spirit of wisdom and hope to be with us as we work with the newly elected leaders in Wyandotte County and in Kansas. And I pray all this in the name of our brother Jesus. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sister Therese, did you notice if the new batter got the run home from third? <laughs> to be honest, I didn't even notice whether he, he got to hit the ball, whether he hit the ball. <laughs> No, uh, we're still struggling. <laughs> All right. Um, we're, are, we begin our meeting tonight with a um, presentation, but first I need to ask uh, Ms. Cobbins if there are any revisions to tonight's agenda. There are no revisions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right. Our first agenda item tonight is we have a presentation from Mark on regional prosperity. Um, Mr. Link, we welcome you here today. Thank you for inviting me. Do I need to get it to which one? What's the slideshow? Okay, thank you. So um, we worked with the Brookings Institution over a period of 18 months or so to try and look at the Kansas City economy and how it was doing relative to peer metros and the rest of the country. And the bottom line is um, pretty much told in this first slide, if I can get it to advance. Um, it's a tale of two decades. In the 1990s, our region was outperforming the nation. We grew faster in terms of output, GDP, jobs, and wages uh, than the country as a whole. Um, but since the turn of the century, our fortunes have not been quite as good. Uh, we are lagging the country in, in all three of those things. Uh, and um, the question is why, what's going on underneath the hood, and this report attempts to look at that. There we go, oops, went too far. So one of the things that we're really proud about here is our productivity, our worker productivity. Um, so the yellow line is output uh, per worker, and the bottom line is output per dollar of compensation, so what it costs to buy a worker. And in both cases, um, it's declining. We've had a productivity advantage for a very long time, but in some industries like manufacturing, we've seen that slip from being, say, 50% more productive than the average manufacturing worker to only being 14% more productive. In other industries, we're less productive. 
Um, and so overall, our productivity advantage has basically eroded and to the point where on output per dollar of compensation, uh, we have no advantage anymore. We look at jobs, uh, a more typical measure of progress. Um, we see that compared to our peers, we have not um, recovered from the recession fully. Uh, many of our peers have, most of them have. We're in the lower, lower third um, of our peers. Uh, and we are still struggling to come back. Over the last year, we have added maybe 5,000 jobs as a metro. Um, in typical years, the 1990s, for example, we were adding 20, 25,000 jobs a year. So we are well below um, uh, what we might consider normal. All metropolitan areas are facing challenges, global challenges. Uh, one of them is the globalization of the, of the economy. So uh, we have competitors all around the world. Uh, there's a lot of uh, outsourcing going on to try and make consumer goods cheaper. Um, but we are, need to play in that world. Uh, even though we're stuck in the middle of the country, we need to export more. Uh, new technologies, there's a lot of new disruptive technologies, everything from uh, the cloud and big data uh, to 3D, 3D printing and uh, biotechnology. And those are changing what is valued and what is valuable to produce. And then finally, demographic changes. We are aging. Uh, many uh, my age are beginning to retire. Um, and uh, the, uh, the diversity of the workforce is increasing. Um, unfortunately, the uh, educational attainment and some of the folks who are coming up behind or has, has not historically been as great um, and that's something we really need to work on. So this is probably of all the charts, graphs, whatever, this is what my boss would say is the most important one. Um, so traditionally um, as local governments and as the region we have focused on uh, on the things that enable growth, um, infrastructure, governance, social equity, and cohesion. And those are really important to building a great quality of life that, that keeps and retains workers. But really drives economies are the, the three things in blue. Traded clusters, what do we sell to the rest of the world? Human capital, how talented are we? And then innovation, how can we do things better and better as time goes on? And the best, the best um, uh, metropolitan areas are really focusing in, as intently or more intently on the drivers as, as the enablers. Those drivers create a, a cycle of prosperity where what we sell to the rest of the world drives demand for talented people who then innovate and we build a better mousetrap and the world beats a path to our door, uh, driving the demand for more people. And so we're able to migrate people in, grow people here, um, and, and uh, get gradually better in a virtuous cycle. Uh, and parts of that, that cycle of prosperity have been uh, disrupted in, in the sense that we are not as innovative um, and our, our trade uh, in many of our traded clusters is, is not keeping pace with the rest of the country. So what, is that, what does the traded um, sector have to do with, uh, with the local economy? Because most people work in that local economy. And really um, the, that cycle of prosperity is what finances the local economy. So when we export, we bring dollars in to the, to the, to the region, and um, that, those dollars are what, are what uh, create the demand for labor uh, locally. And then as people get paid, they have to spend it someplace, and they spend it in the local economy where it recirculates. Um, and as it recirculates, it creates a multiplier. So every, every dollar from exports actually generates two or three dollars locally. Uh, and so those exports are really financing the, the local economy. And as that local economy grows, it needs more workers. And so we hire more workers who, pay, who get paid and spend in the local economy and so on. And it's a very virtuous cycle. Some of that money leaks out, though. We don't, we don't keep it all here. Uh, and uh, we have to buy stuff from outside the region. Uh, and metropolitan areas are very leaky that way. And so that's why it doesn't continue forever. Um, and, and so uh, uh, also money leaks out when we save or, or uh, uh, pay debt that goes to a bank someplace. That's all, those are all uh, monetary leakages. But that local economy then, uh, the dollars that get generated there are what finance our ability to invest as local governments in all these enablers, in infrastructure and in governance and in, and in social equity. So there's a direct line from what we're able to sell to the rest of the world to how we create a great quality of life. Uh, and the great quality of life then allows us to keep the talent once it's here. Um, but uh, it all works together as a system. So regions are, 
having to take this, uh, take on more responsibility. We can't depend on the federal government. We can't depend on the state governments. Um, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, Washington is broken and the states are, are, are difficult to deal with at times. So, um, so the best metropolitan areas are, are finding new ways to lead. And so how can we lead here? That's the question before us. So we look at the three drivers and see how we're doing. These six sectors uh, comprise 80% of our, of our exports uh, as a region and also half of our economy. And so these are really key uh, sectors. These are the pillars of our economy, if you will. And we look at them, uh, we find they're not doing so well. So this is looking at the trade surplus, exports minus imports. Are we exporting more than we're, than we're, um, than we're uh, take, then we're, then are we sending, are we pulling more dollars in than we're sending out? Um, and the answer is yes, uh, but our trade surplus is shrinking. Uh, as so we are becoming more and more dependent on the local economy and less and less dependent on the global economy when in fact the global economy is the one that's growing the most. So this is not good for long-term growth prospects. Secondly, when we look at those sectors individually, we see um, only two of them are doing better, uh, growing faster than the rest of the nation in terms of employment. So professional services, which includes things like Cerner IT, which you have a share of, um, and, uh, and architecture and engineering and, uh, and life sciences, uh, as well as doctors and lawyers and some other things. Uh, it's doing better. It's doing better than the U.S. as a whole. And also manufacturing. So you've got a great manufacturing base here in Wyandotte County, and we are retaining jobs better in, 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 uh, in manufacturing than the rest of the country. But manufacturing as a whole is still losing employment. Look at the, at the same thing in terms of output, GDP, um, how much the value of what we produce. You see, even though some, some sectors were declining in employment, they are growing in terms of the value of what they produce. So manufacturing is a good example. So is wholesale trade, which added no, no jobs, um, but uh, really leads the way in terms of output because the distribution sector is just getting so darn efficient. So there's a lot of, of value uh, being created, but it's not employing very many people. And so, for, uh, to build an economy, you really need something that is growing in terms of jobs and output. And again, professional services is the one that is doing the best. And so when we look at um, those, those six pillars of the economy, only one of them is really strong in all, in all, in all areas. It's growing, it's, it's gaining market share because it's growing faster than the nation. Its productivity relative to the nation is increasing, so, so it becomes more efficient to produce here than elsewhere. And also it's paying workers at a faster rate than here. So the pe people are prospering as well, not just the companies. And so uh, it's doing the best, but only, only, if only one out of the six of our pillars is doing well. Uh, the five, uh, the five of six are showing some cracks. We look at innovation. Um, this is patents. There's no great data on innovation. Uh, you probably all know that. But uh, one day, piece of data that we can get is, is on patents. And we considerably lag the nation in our ability to generate new inventions, uh, which is what this is trying to measure, uh, although it has been increasing recently. And also, um, the firms that are producing patents is really narrow. So Sprint, Embark, Cerner, and Garmin account for 50%, over 50% of our region's patents. And then a variety of, of smaller producers uh, also account for the other half. But it's very concentrated here. Um, and the best metropolitan areas have a much broader base so that, so that innovations can be um, shared or swapped or licensed, probably a better term, uh, among sectors as well as, uh, as within a company. <coughs> Uh, one thing that we do better than average is we start up high-tech firms uh, better than our peers, uh, better than the bulk of our peers. We've really improved in that over the last 20 years. Uh, better than national average, better than uh, we're in the top third of our peers on this. But if you look at overall business formation, our ability to create new, new firms in general, number one, as a nation, it has declined since the 1990s. And number two, we are doing worse than the nation in just overall business formation. We look at the talent of our people. We are better educated than the nation as a whole. We have a higher proportion of our uh, of our adults are are have a, a college degree or better, um, uh, and so that's the 33.5 percent versus the 29.1 percent. But compared to to large metros, we are no better. We have no advantage really. Um, and our our. Our education is not matched up very well with uh, where the jobs are. So 40% um, of new job openings require a bachelor's degree. Only 33% of our folks have a bachelor's degree. 
And most of our, our degrees are not in science, engineering, technology, and math, so STEM degrees. It's in business and education, um, which are great fields, but most of the growth is in the, science, in the, in the sciences. And so we, we, are, we are lagging the nation in terms of how well we are preparing for those uh, innovation-oriented degrees. Uh, if we look at, this, this graph takes a little bit of explanation, but if we look at migration to and from large metros besides the state, outside the state of Kansas and Missouri, we see that we are losing our most educated people to them. We are losing more than we are gaining. Um, if you include um, migration from places like Lawrence and Manhattan and Columbia, we, we do pull from there. We, we gain more than we lose to those places. But to the larger metros around the country, we are losing. And then the labor force is becoming more diverse, but whites and Asians have uh, twice the, um, uh, the uh, educational attainment. Um, they earn bachelor's degrees at any rate at twice the rate as blacks and Hispanics. And that's a real challenge for us because we all know the Hispanic population is the fastest growing segment of our population. So we really need to, to work on uh, bringing everyone up to the same level and, and beyond. Uh, we have a grant from the Lumina Foundation to work on uh, educational attainment, raising that to 60% of folks have a post-secondary degree, an AA degree, a certificate, or a, uh, or a bachelor's degree. And we're about 40% 40, 40 when you include all those different degree types um, as a region. So we have a long ways to go. And then what does all this mean to the average person? Well, real incomes haven't, haven't increased since the, since the 1990s. As a matter of fact, incomes today are below what they were in the 1980s. Uh, and so uh, you can't uh, have a great economy if people aren't prospering. Ultimately, we need uh, to find a way to create uh, good, good paying jobs uh, for everyone. Well, that's the challenge. This is no different here than, than elsewhere, but because our economy is growing more slowly, it's actually more difficult here than elsewhere. So the best metropolitan areas are facing these challenges and turning them into opportunities. And they exhibit four um, characteristics. Uh, one is that they work from a common set of objectives across metropolitan areas. All metropolitan areas have divisions, maybe none as severe as ours. We have probably the most equally split metropolitan area in the country. Um, but, but nonetheless, you're able to come together around a common set of goals and objectives. They focus on those market fundamentals, those, those three drivers that I talked about. They organize uh, for success, and somehow they're able to turn their states into partners. Um, by being, by being, being able to speak as one metropolitan voice, they have a bigger voice in their state capitals. And so, what are we going to do here? What are we going to do to rise to the challenge? Um, the um, the Mid-America Regional Council, um, the Area Development Council, the Civic Council uh, have come together to try and, and create uh, what has been called up to now a metropolitan business plan, a business-led effort uh, to try and tackle these drivers, but with broad-based government and, and civic, um, civic support. So um, it's, it's being um, created uh, with a steering committee uh, that'll have about 15 to 20 members, and uh, this will, who's on, those, on, the, on the steering committee will be announced uh, on, um, I think, the 11th of November. Um, and, uh, and then it'll also be uh, explored further at the AEDC's uh, Area Development Council's um, uh, annual meeting on November 14th. And the role of the steering committee is to establish the overall goals and organize three work groups around the three drivers that I mentioned and to try and integrate them into a seamless strategy and to try and uh, uh, become a way that we can speak as a single, as a single region on issues of, of importance, economic importance uh, to the entire region. And then the work groups are around those three drivers that I've said, innovation, entrepreneurship, globally competitive sectors is what we're calling the traded clusters, and then uh, human capital. Um, and uh, who's on those right now is still, is still being organized. So I, I'll get to the timeline in a second, but basically it's still being an effort that's being organized to the end of this year, and then uh, uh, next year um, it will uh, begin to work on identifying the issues, uh, seeing where there's, uh, there's uh, gaps in our, in our ability to, to compete, and then uh, working on the strategies to fill those gaps. So the time frame is sometime over the, over the next year this, this intends to be done. Uh, and I mentioned the, th the three partners uh, that, are, that are working together. Uh, the chamber, Greater Kansas City Chamber is also involved and many chambers uh, uh, will, will, will be involved, um, perhaps in the work groups or on specific issues as they come up. 
the the uh, I don't think it's I don't think we have it here, but the the plan is to have uh, very periodic. Uh, um, so the, there'll be meetings. Some of them will be behind. It's a private. It's a business-led uh, effort. So some of them will be behind closed doors. But uh, in order to make sure that it is broad-based, uh, there'll be plenty of time for folks to, to check in at, at, at public meetings that are held throughout the process. So um, that's sort of where we are. It's a sobering uh, report, I think. Um, but I think we are rising to the challenge. All right, any questions or comments from the commission? Um, I want to thank the Mid-America Le Regional Council's leadership on these issues. Um, when we talk about economic development in Wyandotte County, we need to know that we're doing that in the context of a metropolitan area across county lines and across state lines. And really the leader in that is, uh, is Mark, the Mid-America Regional Council. So I thank you for coming tonight. Um, and for your presentation, so. One thing I would also add is at the board level, we've been engaging our board in a conversation about what can local governments do uh, to uh, help the region be a player in an innovation-based economy. So I'd urge you to think about that as well and to bring that then back to the Mark board. Great. Thank right. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Link. All right, that completes the mayor's agenda. Uh, that brings us now to our consent agenda. And I ask if any member of the commission, staff, or citizen in attendance tonight wishes to set aside an item on tonight's consent agenda, you would need to step forward at this time and state your name and address for the record and ask that item be set aside. Any item that is not set aside will be voted on with the consent agenda in a single vote. Commissioner Markley. I'd like to pull item number six, the boards and commissions process, just uh, to sort of clarify what was decided at the committee level and how that's different than what we talked about here. Item number six is set aside. Are there any others? Move for, move for approval for all remaining items. Second. All right. Let the record show I see no one else moving uh, to the microphone. It is properly moved and seconded. Roll call. Roll call Townsend. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Bugia. Aye. Maddox. Aye. Kane. Aye. Markley. Aye. Walters. Aye. Philbrook. Aye. Walker. Aye. The vote is nine to zero. That motion carries. Commissioner Maddox. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I simply at this point wanted to thank um, a lot of the citizens that came out from the community uh, in support of item seven that just passed uh, in the consent agenda for ban the box. Just wanted to say simply thank you. I uh, wanted to also thank the staff for also being a part of that and putting the ordinance together. And I also wanted to thank the commissioners who are all on board um, and believed in passing this ordinance. Um, as the minister spoke at the mic, um, and, and, and prayed us into this ceremony. She spoke of the young man who didn't have a chance at bat. And so that was a, an example that we just um, uh, put here forth in front of everybody as us coinciding with each other. We said, uh, let's give them a chance at bat. And that is something that um, I think people appreciate at home. People watching and the felons in this community will have a shot uh, at something. I want to thank uh, Moore Square, who has been on from the jump as an advocate group. I want to also thank the Wanda County NAACP, uh, also CCO, and uh, Wyco Kim, who are all advocate groups who are also pushing the campaign throughout our community uh, to ask other employers to take the big step to allow um, felons employment in their uh, workforce so I just want to say thank you and thanks to my fellow commissioners thank you all right thank you I would um, I would say I would like to thank Commissioner Maddox who's taken leadership on this issue I'm proud to be a community that has banned the box here in Kansas City Kansas Wyandotte County um, I would give this opportunity those of you who came tonight in support of that issue if you'd like to stand at this time and show your support I encourage you to do so all right Thank you all very much for your advocacy. You are welcome to stay for the remainder of our meeting. I promise it will be riveting. Um, if, you choose, if you choose not to stay for the remainder of the meeting, I would encourage you to leave quietly so as we continue um, our work tonight. But thank you all very much for your work on this.
Commissioner Philbrook. I just wanted to let those folks that are here uh, about this uh, box issue, that workforce partnership who works diligently to try to find jobs for folks in this area. I got a call from the director today telling me that I want you guys to vote for that, and we've been wanting something like that to happen in Wyandotte County for a long time. So just want to let you know you're not the only ones. You're welcome. All right, that brings us to item number six. Um, consent agenda number six was pulled off. Boards and commissions appointment process. I'll recognize Commissioner Markley at this time who chaired the standing committee. Thank you, Mayor. I just I pulled this off because there's one item of discussion that we as a full commission and then separately as a standing committee sort of went back and forth on and I wanted to make sure that everybody understood where we'd landed and that is the issue of um, where where the terms would fall in terms of with the um, sitting commissioner. So Jody did a good job of calling it out for us in our cover page of our little cover page that comes with this issue. Um, we initially as a standing committee said we would prefer if it did not if the terms did not match up with the commissioner's terms, but what we heard back from staff was that it was just really unworkable and that if our goal was trying to clean up the process, that we weren't gonna be doing that if we kept the terms all strangely staggered as they were previously. So I just wanted to call it out so that nobody was surprised um, by that change. The recommendation from staff and from our subcommittee, our standing committee, uh, is that the terms be uh, contiguous and all roll over at the same time, which would be, as it stands now, June 1st is, would be the big day for the rollovers. All right. Is there any conversation about this? Mr. Bach. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will just offer my experience to this point that over the years we see it, Appointments to the boards and the commissions um, being one where it's a it's a difficult process. I know a lot of people come on. Many of you come on don't even are not even really aware of how many boards and commissions you'll be appointing to. Um, so I guess I would just express my caution that I think it's a good idea for you to all move the boards and the commissions to a point that there are people that are accountable to you early in your term in office. But if you remember back to the first two months after you were elected. Um, there's a lot of items that are being thrown at you. And for us to tell you, you needed to appoint 25 new board members um, for every one of the committees we have for half of the, or at least half of them, that's a lot to go through in a couple of months. So I would probably recommend you think about maybe a, a little longer term um, and maybe get you through the budget cycle and realize you could start appointing or maybe stagger them over the first six months in office or something like that. All right, thank you. Appointment. Commissioner Philbrook. Uh, I believe when we were talking about it at the standing committee level that we said the earliest, it didn't mean we had to put them in immediately and that the person who was in there at the time would carry on until we named their successor. So we, we uh, hedged our bets a little bit on that one, sir. I believe that's the way it's written, isn't it? Okay. All right. Commissioner Merguia. Thanks, Mayor. I just want to again extend my appreciation to the leadership role that Commissioner Markley has taken. You know, for some reason, Commissioner, you always get saddled with an enormous amount of administrative work. Um, you're very good at it, and I personally appreciate it. Um, we're all good at different things, but particularly you lead the charge, you and Commissioner McKiernan, on administrative work around here. And I just want to let you both know I really appreciate that. All right. Is there any uh, further discussion? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Um, the item is before us. Seeing no further discussion, roll call. Roll call. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Gia? Aye. Maddox? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Walker? Aye. The vote is 9-0. to zero. That motion carries. All right. That brings us now to our public hearing agenda. Item number one is a resolution setting a public hearing to consider a community improvement district for Lane 4 Property Group. It's been fast-tracked from last Monday's Economic Development and Finance Standing Committee. Um, it was approved at that time. Again, what we're doing is setting a public hearing, um, not approving the project. So I can move for approval on the date. 
You may, I do need to open the public hearing, but yes, immediately following the public hearing, I have, no, 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 you're right. Just setting, setting, or setting the, the date. Public. It's all right. There we okay. Go. <laughs> <laughs> We're not ready for that yet. Yes, I'm ready for a motion. <laughs> okay, move that we set the date for public hearing. Second. All right, before I change my mind, roll call. <laughs> <laughs> roll call, Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Maddox? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Walker? Aye. The vote is nine to zero. The motion carries. Um, I'm actually going to do, we have one last kind of uh, administrative item at the end on the commissioner's agenda. I'm going to take that first before we do the ethics code. A travel request from Commissioner Maddox. Second. Roll call. Thanks. Roll call. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Maddox? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Walker? Aye. The vote is 9-0. to zero. That motion carries. All right, that brings us to our last item now on the agenda, which is the proposed amendments to the Ethics Code. You may remember that we met as a commission on April 10th in special session, and there were a number of requests by the commission, this commission to the Ethics Commission to evaluate. Um, the Ethics Commission has met. They have unanimously approved the proposed amendments to come to us, and now we're going to have a presentation um, so well, kind of a multi-layered uh, presentation. There were a number of questions that came up during the process last April. And so we're going to have a presentation tonight. The idea is the staff, the, the legal staff has not yet drafted um, ordinance changes to the ethics code. They wanted to wait until after you heard this presentation, had time to consider it. Um, they mostly didn't want to draft ordinances until you all had your input and so they were drafting ordinances hopefully once rather than twice so that's the um, effort tonight so we're going to begin I believe uh, Ken Moore from our legal department is going to begin the presentation and as he's coming forward I want to recognize uh, two elected officials who are here uh, Mary Ann Flunder from the Community College and Crystal Watson is here from District 500 thank you both for being here tonight thank you Mayor Commissioner As the mayor indicated, this is a follow-up to the April 10th special session. Um, and again, we're, we don't have a proposed ordinance today. What we'd like to get is some input from you either at this meeting or subsequent to this meeting as to your thoughts so that we can uh, draft an ordinance which in final form we'd submit to you for approval. Our, our presentation is going to be uh, basically in three segments, kind of a historical perspective and the legal framework for the ethics code which I will present, the real world application, the process, which Tom West, Wiss, our legislative auditor, will present, and then finally, the amendments to the ethics code, which the commission requested, and also those proposed and adopted by the ethics commission. And our ethics administrator, Ruth Benin, will present that section. Okay. Uh, prior to consolidation, the city had an ethics code, but it only applied to employees. It did not apply to elected officials. The county did not have an ethics code. There was a uh, consolidation study commission which was formed as authorized by special legislation in 1996. Uh, that uh, commission had months of public hearings, took input from citizens, elected officials, uh, staff officials, and then they uh, rendered their consolidation study report in 1997, in January of 1997. Section four of that is entitled Unified Government Integrity and it established the position of a legislative auditor, it created the Ethics Commission, and it provided for an ethics code. On April 1 of 1997, 60% of Wyandotte County voters approved the consolidation study report. And upon approval, that, that report is what we now refer to as the Unified Government Charter. The report and the charter provides for an independent legislative auditor appointed by the district court judges. And it, as the report says, it provides independent scrutiny of the performance and operation of government officers and employees, 
and it provides a direct method for citizens to uh, register complaints. The report also provided for an ethics commission, and it, is, it states to uphold the responsible behavior of elected officials, and the, elect, the ethics commission is appointed by the chief judge, the district attorney, and the legislative auditor, and that's what we refer to as the ad hoc committee. Members of the Ethics Commission serve a single four-year term. Those terms are staggered. And they're empowered to recommend changes to the code, investigate complaints, censure those in violation of the code, and recommend actions uh, to the county administrator for employees who violate the code. Now, the Ethics Code, according to the Charter, uh, it applies to all elected and appointed officials. The Ethics Code uh, makes it applicable to employees. And the Ethics Code was not adopted by, as part of the Charter. The Charter says it's to be adopted by the Unified Government Commission. So the Charter requires an Ethics Commission and requires a legislative auditor and empowers you to adopt the Ethics Code. Kind of the last area I want to talk about since there was some conversation uh, in, back in April about you know, the state law ethics code and, and uh, state law alternatives. Kansas has a governmental ethics commission, and they, their primary functions are to enforce Kansas campaign laws and also the Kansas conflict of interest statutes with respect to state employees and officials. They do not have any enforcement power against uh, local officials and employees. Now, it applies to local officials and employees, but, but there's no enforcement at the state level. They have no authority to investigate or receive local level complaints. Violations are referred to the district attorney or the attorney general for criminal prosecution, and they are authorized to issue advisory opinions upon a written request. So essentially, on the local level, governmental ethics will only render an advisory opinion. But there are state conflict of interest statutes. Well, this kind of just repeats with the, from their Government Ethics Commission, uh, their website. It, it defines their, uh, their uh, in, uh, role as advisory only, and they lack jurisdiction to hear or determine complaints. There's kind of a list of the state ethics statutes as well as the UG Ethics Code. As you can see, the uh, state ethics statutes are much more limited in scope than the UG Code. Uh, the main thing it does is it defines what a uh, substantial interest is, and in many respects, that definition is the same uh, definition that we use in our, the UG Ethics Code. It's not much different. It requires that you file a statement of substantial interest uh, in April of every year if, if it's changed from the previous year. They uh, can issue advisory opinions, and it prohibits you from acting in any situation where there's a conflict because it, where you have a substantial interest, and that, that gives rise to a conflict, or you have to abstain from taking any action. And it also uh, has criminal penalties for, for failing to, uh, for, for violating those statutes. There is no administrative enforcement at the local level. It's purely... Uh, uh, criminal prosecution, basically. And then, as you can see, the UG Ethics Code uh, deals with more, more issues. It prevents the conflicts of interest, similar to the state. We uh, have regulations on political activities. Uh, we have the same kind of similar provisions for contract, contracts that come before you and for in disqualification. We have restrictions on acceptance of uh, gifts and gratuities and kickbacks. Uh, and then prohib prohibits contingent fees protects confidential information, has a section on prestige of office and nepotism, whistleblowing, and then, of course, the ethics uh, oath and pledge. So that's really the, the legal framework of how our ethics code came about and the distinction between how our code is different from the state level and the enforcement of that. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll turn it over to Tom for his part. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, wondered if there was a chance we could get Miss Flunder a space heater. 
If we if we had that if we had that community college money, we could afford to yeah, keep true. the building. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to uh, talk about the process of appointing uh, uh, ethics commission and ethics administrator, and, and Kenny touched on some of that already. First, though, I would like to introduce the ethics commission. Um, if you would stand up when I call your name. Uh, our chair, Tammy Sh Shadowman. Eth ethics commissioner, Dana rank by Pat Bruni. Pastor George Kemper, Sr., and Anthony or Tony Viegas. As Kenny said, those folks are appointed by the Ad Hoc Appointment Committee, which is comprised of the Chief uh, District Court Judge, Legislative Auditor, and the District Attorney. Uh, I'll introduce Judge Wayne Lampson now, um, as you probably all know him. Mr. Gorman, the DA, wasn't able to make it. He had another engagement. Um, the Ethics Commission, their function is to ensure the implementation of, of the Ethics Code, review and, re, and uh, report code violations. Oh, yeah. There's their names. <laughs> And here, here are their functions of the Ethics Commissions. Uh, conduct meetings at least semi-annually, and in practice they actually meet monthly, the first Thursday of each month. Render advisory opinions with the assistance of the Ethics Administrator. Recommend improvements to the code as they are doing tonight, and investigate and resolve complaints as they come in. As far as the functions of the Ethics ethics administrator, they are, they, she receives the complaints, resolve ethical matters and questions, conducts investigations, recommends a censure, uh, conducts ethics trainings of UG ethic, uh, elected officials, officers, and employees, and renders advisory opinions. Now, she is appointed by the legislative auditor position, and in practice, I enlist the other two members of the ad hoc committee to uh, participate in the interviews and get their feedback as to who they feel would be the best candidate. Um, we put together a few uh, stats on what we've received and what the Ethics uh, Commission has handled in the last five years. In the last five years, we received 253 complaints rendered 277 advisory opinions, conducted 122 training sessions for employees, elected officials, and uh, attended by over 2,000 individuals. And again, they meet monthly. Um, I'd like to, if there aren't any questions on that part of it, I'd like to introduce Ruth Benin, the ethics administrator, to go through the proposed amendments that the Ethics Commission approved. Thank you. You all should have received, well, earlier <clears throat> this week, a copy of the actual uh, proposed, what I call the strikeout of red line version of the actual code that shows you in each section what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to summarize for you the amendments, but if you You've want got to, to use the microphone for the people on TV. Sorry. Um, you should all have a copy of this. Um, I also distributed, again tonight, a copy of the summary of the amendments. Uh, main difference is I actually signed that one, and at the very back of it, there's a chart that was referred to that is included in that. Otherwise, it's the same as the one you got on Monday. Um, as I say, but if you have the strikeout copy, it actually shows where the proposed changes go in. That's in our packet. Yeah, it should have been on Monday. I think it was just went out Monday, and it's in our packet that we have either on paper or online okay. uh, tonight. Oops. Is that the small name? Should we start again?
What am I doing here wrong? I thought Tom told me to do this one. I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay, I thought I had a slide on this. I said slide 15. Um, <clears throat> sorry for that. Um, as indicated on April 10th, myself, um, uh, Chief Judge Lampson, uh, the Legislative Auditor, members of the Ethics Commission appeared before you all with reference to certain questions you had about the process and procedure for the Ethics Code and the Commission and the process, and there were specific requests made. As a result of those requests, the Ethics Commission considered each and every one and went through them and made determinations as to whether there was a need for amendment clarification, and on in the July meeting, um, on a unanimous vote, they proposed the amendments that are before you tonight. There were basically six areas that were brought up by all of you that you wanted clarification or input with respect to. Those were, first of all, due process in matters related to um, appearing before the Ethics Administrator or the UG Ethics Commission, right of appeal from sanctions, clarification with respect to prestige of office and customary, um, usual and customary, review of recusal positions for unified government commissioners, review of the length of time of a public censure, um, how long it should be posted on the UG website, and review of the investigative processes in place under the code and the resources to ensure that the ethics administrator had the proper resources. Um, at the time we undertook these, there was also a request made back um, to the UG commissioners if there were any other areas that they wanted to have looked at, there were none. Now, in addition to that, however, because it is their job as ethics commissioners, while we were conducting this re review, and you have before you tonight those additional proposed amendments, the Ethics Commission on its own has made recommendation for four to five amendments, one with reference to nepotism, a couple with reference to political activities, a conflict of interest, additional one over and above what you all requested, um, so I'll change in the Ethics Commission in terms of removal of commission members, and then at the very end, and I'm not going to go through those tonight, there's a bunch of clarifying amendments where we corrected misspelled words or um, added in things to make it consistent. So um, kind of grouping these together then, the first section I want to cover were the requests with reference to due process, right to respond and appeal, and also the, the public censure posting. Um, in terms of what is proposed in the amendment, the amendment um, with reference to due process, we've specifically included in section 22557 um, a statement with reference to due process so that all of you understand that is the process that has always been followed. We have just specifically for your comfort level and your information actually set it out in the actual ethics code, so it's there. Um, with reference to the process. Basically, what we have put in there is that any unified government representative, and when we use that term in the code, that's elected officials, appointed officials, and employees, anyone that has a, a subject to discipline, um, censure, whatever it may be in the case of an elected employee, has a right to respond in the matter that's now specifically set out. And that is basically that they receive a copy of, whether it's a public censure, a private censure, um, some other type of memorandum, they receive a copy of that, and they are given the opportunity, either verbally or in writing, to respond to that. And then after that, the memorandum will issue unless it's found that it's no longer warranted based on that response. Um, as I indicated, these are simply that this is simply the process that's been followed. The other thing we did for your benefit is in terms of section 255, and these are all the sections dealing with um, the process for actually the ethics administrator and what remedies are available for sanctions under the code. We've also specifically set out the factors that are looked at. These are factors that we have always looked at in terms of any discipline, whether it be public censure, private censure, or any other type of write-up or review or interview. But it now in the code specifically sets those out. Now, when I say that, that's a guideline. Um, we're going to look at them, but again, they're the factors that we look at in review. Um, in terms of right, well, let me go back. In terms of right of appeal, oh, maybe I'll go back. Maybe I won't. Um, in terms of right of appeal, basically, when we covered this, I think, in the meeting in April, because of the way the code is set up, it's a unified government ordinance. Um, 
the Ethics Commission is created by your charter, but in terms of the actual Ethics Commission itself, it does not have authority to command the Municipal Court of Wyandotte Johnson or Kansas City, Kansas, or the District Court of Wyandotte County to hear any appeal that comes off of any discipline. Now when I say that, employees are entitled to whatever appeal rights they have either through the union or the grievance or the county administrator's office and those remain for them. With reference to elected officials, because we can't remove you from office, we can't civilly penalize you for anything. The only remedy that we have is either a public censure or a private censure or you know, calling you up and saying please don't do this. Um, that's why there's not any right of appeal for the elected officials. And quite frankly, I don't know how you would create one. I think, I don't know, legal would have to address that. You would have to, I think, amend the municipal charter to somehow give it jurisdiction. You certainly wouldn't be able to tell the state of Kansas that they had to take jurisdiction over it. So again, it's not that we're opposed to not having a right of appeal. There is none for that reason. The final area in this kind of topic area was in terms of the investigation of complaints and what all was involved. As Tom indicated, I basically handle those investigations, but as has always been the case, um, I have all of the resources, and what we've simply done is state in the actual code what the resources are that I have available. That's the legislative auditor's office, the district attorney, the office of the mayor, the office of the county administrator, the human resource department, fire department, legal department, um, internal affairs, police department. I have all of those available, but there's also a check and balance with that also in that I have to go through the legislative auditor. So it's made sure that I'm properly using the resources, but those are all there. So I have all the investigative resources that I need. So other than listing those in the code, the UG Ethics Committee did not make any other changes um, in terms of any requirements. The rest of the amendment section there um, is simply we clarified the available discipline. It was a little bit or discombulated in terms of who makes recommendations. For example, as an ethics administrator, I make the recommendation to the legislative auditor, but for personnel, employees, he then has to go, in this case, to the county administrator because under the human resource policies, it is a county administrator or his or her departments that actually take the disciplinary action against the employee. So that's simply clarifying that. Now the final area was with reference to the public censure. And it was requested to include something in terms of a time period. The recommendation of the UG Ethics Commission was, and we specifically have it included now as amendment with reference to the section in 255, again dealing with the duties um, of the ethics administrator. It's recommended that a public censure, if made, be posted for the term of office or a minimum of 90 days, depending on the nature and severity of the conduct. And that would be set out in the actual memorandum when it is distributed. Um, finally, in terms of moving off of kind of due process right of appeal, the next section that you ask us to look at was with reference to section 265. That's the prestige of office section of the code. And you ask us to look at defining usual and customary and to further defining and explain prestige of office. And we have tried to do that. And again, it's your code, it's your own ordinance. If anyone wants to make changes, whatever else, but this was our best idea or thought process of how to handle that. In this case, we actually define usual and customary. We went through like, you know, Black's legal dictionaries, other things, the ordinary usage of the term and phrase, and we've put a definition in there for you to better guide you in terms of what would be considered usual and customary. In this case, we have it actions or conduct taken in keeping with, agreeing with, or established by custom or common usage, regular or routine duties of an official or employee, such as those actions germane to the fundamental functions of government. And then, as it was done in some other sections of the code in the definitional sections, we even set forth some examples of what would be considered usual and customary and what would not be considered usual and customary. In addition, as we've mentioned numerous times, there is always, that's why there's the provision for providing of advisory opinions. Because if you've got a question and you think something should or shouldn't be found within that exception, and the way the code is always set up, there's an A section that tells you what you can't do. You can't solicit gifts. Um, you can't use the prestige of your office for your own gain or the gain of another. And then there's a B section that gives the exception. And that's, in this case, the usual and customary. And that's kind of how to look at the code when you're looking through it. 
So in addition, we also looked at prestige of office. And that's where a lot of you had questions in terms of, well, when, is, when I can I do this, when can I do that? The way the code is written and the language is used and the commissioners wanted to keep it that way is that it's your own personal gain or the gain of another, which that includes nonprofits. It's not just personal gain, and we specifically enumerate that now in the code. But now the other thing we did, in part for budget conservation reasons, we specifically set out, and in three cases, we've specifically listed certain activities or events that would be found to be usual and customary. Three of those, United Way, uh, the Historical Foundation, and the Park and Recs Foundation, you all have already voted in with a resolution that that is not a violation of the ethics code, it's usual and customary, and it doesn't otherwise violate that public, public funds for charitable purposes section. So again, and there's another specific section that says at any time, and I know I've told you all this in training um, and in other uh, aspects when you've gone through the training, that if at any point in time you think an event should qualify or be under that, to simply contact me and obtain an advisory opinion. And that, um, let me go ahead just a moment. What I was referring to you, what you all should now have is this is the chart that sets out going back just a minute to the resources that are available to me in terms of all the different departments and everything else. That's handed out in every training session um, that is provided by my office to elected officials or other officials. Let me go back here a minute. Then the final section that you all ask that we look at is with reference to recusal. And we've tried to again make it more explicit, more direct, more friendly user to you all. Um, first of all, we changed the language of the code so that if a nonprofit and if, if there's an elected official or an appointed official that has a relationship with a nonprofit that you aren't getting personal financial benefit from, you can now vote as long as you, before you vote, give full public disclosure as to what your relationship is with that entity and or what relationship you have had with, quote, the matter that was involved. Now, we are not addressing, I think Mayor Holland has brought it up a couple times, we're not making any determination on your all behalf as to whether or not you have a, quote, fiduciary duty of some other kind as a board member, for example, to recuse yourself. We're simply saying under the code. And the other thing we're clarifying that I know a couple of you have told me you had prior opinions from my predecessor that even if you have to recuse yourself from a specific item vote, you still have the right to vote on the general budget as long as you've given disclosure. The final one that we put in, we actually included for your benefit. It wasn't something you requested, but we had a situation that's come up in the past where the way the code reads, it says, if you have any interest in some matter that's coming up before, you can't vote. And we actually had commissioners who had to sell stock to be able to vote on certain votes. This basically changes that to say, hey, unless you've got over 5% of the stock in you know, some major corporation, you can vote. Then, as I indicated, I'll move over now to the other amendments that the UG Ethics Commission proposed. First, nepotism. We didn't do anything major there. We just realized there never was a definition of parent, which is kind of odd if you've got the definition of child. So we included one, and then we also included natural child as a child under the definition section. Um, that was the only change that was made there. With reference to the commissioners, um, and this may tie in with the, the discussion you were having about appointment of commissioners, it was the feeling of the Ethics Commission, and the two changes proposed here were one, because the Ethics Commission is created by charter, it's technically not under the code, but the Ethics Code makes them under the code. We also changed it to provide a provision for removal of an ethics commissioner, in this case by the appointing authority of the legislative auditor, the uh, district attorney, and the chief judge. We've done the same thing or made the same proposal for you all with reference to the feeling of the commission was that just because you appoint someone, if they're engaged in bad behavior, you shouldn't have to keep them in there until the end of their term. So we've put in a provision where if they're found to have violated the ethics code, with reference to my work as ethics administrator, I can make a recommendation to the legislative auditor to come back to whoever of you were the appointing authority and say we'd like to have this individual removed. So it's giving you some ability there. The final main section, permitted and prohibited political activities. Um, basically, a couple changes there, again, for your benefit. One is we've included, and it's actually the same language as a state ethics commission statute that was issued this year that basically says um, you can't 
uh, it prohibits production, forwarding, authorization for forwarding of email, Facebook, Twitter, or other social media in a unified government computer using unified government title or resources. And that's the same thing that the state says. We simply incorporated it in. And the reason why is we had some complaints in the last election about people inappropriately using email to campaign for political causes or political candidates. The other thing that we included was, and this came from 2009, it was the only thing that was sent back over from those amendments, is the issue of if you are a UG employee and you're running for mayor or UG commissioner, you have to resign your employment to run. The Ethics Commission thought that was a little harsh, and the proposal now is that you don't have to resign to run, but you do have to resign if you win. And again, we brought that one back because that's what we were told to do, that we, I hadn't put in the language of have to resign if you win, and that's why it's back over here. And then finally, with reference to the permitted and prohibited political activities, we cleaned up the language because uh, Council Moore and I figured out in the one election, the way the language read, it seemed to prohibit an incumbent elected official, a UG official, from using their title of office in their own campaign election materials because it's specifically that you can't use your political title for any kind of endorsement in any kind of election ad. So we've cleaned that up to make sure you all are okay to say re-elect whoever the commissioner is. Um, and then, uh, as I said, we, that was the change that we proposed. Um, otherwise, I'm not going to go through unless someone wants me to. The amendments, the amendments at the end that are called overall clerical or clarifying amendments, they're not substantive, they simply define things or change things or correct uh, misspellings, that sort of thing. All right, Commissioner Kane. Well, we appreciate your hard work, uh, all of you. I really like that reelect part. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, if you get reelected, maybe three times, I don't know. The, the only concern I have, and this, I guess this is the union person coming out of me. Uh, I don't understand that if we don't have the right to appeal something, or we, I mean, do we get the right to say, hey, I disagree with you? We specifically, there's always been that right, like in the public censures, that before it was actually issued, and we've now clarified it to say you can do it verbally, in writing, within three days. Yes, you have the right to come to us and say, I disagree with your decision. But in terms of appealing, if we say we're still going to uphold the, the public censure, now granted, you've got a check and balance there of Tom's got to agree with me, and if he doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere, and I also actually get the approval of the Ethics Commission before we ever take that type of action. But otherwise, my point is, and this may be more of a question for legal, I don't think a UG ordinance, which is what the Ethics Code is, can command, well, one, it's a function of, uh, uh, I'm just saying, I don't think that they can command that the- I'll ask Al Walker gonna, to, would like to respond. I'm gonna address this as a question. Um, more to legal, maybe to Judge Lampson. I believe there is the right of appeal, and it's statutory. There is a provision in state law the last time that I looked, which probably has been four years, um, that permitted appeals to the district court of any agency decision by a local government. Now, it's a limited form of review. It's not a new trial uh, unless there's some independent cause of action. It's simply you appeal to the district court and they um, review the, f the facts, the record, and if there are facts that support the decision, then they uphold it. If not, they reverse it and send it back to the agency. And I'm sure it exists, or did exist. So I guess my thought would be that if that statute is still in force, there is the right of appeal. It's not a. It's not going to be very successful very often, but once in a while it might provide a course of review. You see, it's more like an uh, unemployment compensation appeal, for example, where you can go to the district court. Yeah, I mean, court. we have a lot of commissions and agencies that make decisions, and you know they can come to us and we can make a decision. But just like planning and zoning. Uh, those decisions are appealable to the district court. We'll, we'll certainly be statute for that, but the other agencies that we have that make decisions that affect people's lives can, I'm sure, it's in Chapter 12, I believe, can be appealed 
directly to the district court for review and it's just a very cursory review of did the agency have the any facts to support its decision and certainly i will work with legal to figure out if that's still in if force or effect in there i would want some reference to that in the um oh here i've moved it back the uh right to, to appeal that yeah it's section you know, 255 pursuant to CASA. okay okay uh, good okay Thank you. Commissioner Kane, you have more? Yep. Uh, one, I want to thank the commission for your work. I know nobody ever uh, thanks you folks, and, and it <laughs> takes time. And, and you do the hidden hard work for us, and we appreciate it. And especially Mr. Wiss, because I will call him and ask him before I do something to make sure it is not wrong. And he gives me a very upfront and blunt answer, and I much appreciate that. All right. Uh, Commissioner Merguia. Hmm? Commissioner, oh. Commissioner Maddox, oh. you need a light to your light for Thanks, me. Mayor. Hey, I know I was going to have some questions. And Ms. Ruth, you talk real fast. So I was trying to grasp everything. Um, I've got a question. And the first question is, uh, what in the old or current um, um, ethics ordinance gives the ethics administrator or the ethics department the authority to ask a commissioner to resign? It would be the section 255 where there's entitlement for the ethics administrator through the legislative auditor to make varying requests. I can't force you to resign. I can't move you from, move you from office. I mean, you're correct on that. There's, that's why we were talking about the right of appeal. There's no provision <clears throat> that the ethics code can ever remove any of you from office. My understanding of the only way you can ever be removed from office is either by a, a petition in your district and or an ouster proceeding by the district attorney. Okay. So, so what would be the purpose of issuing something such as a paper like that? I mean, I, it, 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 I don't a want... suggestion that based on the conduct that was found, it was probably to the level where a resignation should be considered. Again, we can't make you do it. Okay, and I and I thought I read something or or heard, heard something to where I guess the the in the new line of the ethics uh, ordinance where uh, I guess the communication will now go from the ethics uh, administrator to the county auditor and then from the county auditor to the county administrator. Oh, Is that the new? I'm sorry, that only relates to employees. Uh, because the way that the, the, the Human Resource Department is set up, if we're sanctioning an employee under the, the Human Resource Code, personnel policies, whatever else, it's actually the county administrator who has to take that action. So that was dealing with employees. Because employees are subject to, for example, actual monetary penalties, demotion, suspension, termination, and there have been employees who have been terminated in whole or in part for a violation of the ethics code. So that's why in their world there is a definite right of appeal. And we'll certainly check on what Commissioner Walker referenced in terms of if there's some other statute that gives you all a right. Okay. And in regards to the public censor, we kind of just bounced right over that. But um, with, can we go back to that slide? The slide? Sure. I can find it here. I don't. Uh, the other one. Is it, do I have it in the slide? One more back? No, four. Oh. I believe that's the one. Oh. Yeah. Oh, this is the okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's down. I'm sorry. It's down at the very bottom. Okay. Now, that's, the, the statement to me is a little gray area. I don't, I don't understand if we say 90 days or then the last part says, depending on the severity of the violation, uh, who decides the severity and then who decides the, the time amount after the severity? Again, that would be one, going back to the other slide and reference I made, um, we have now specifically set out the factors in section 255. It's where it's talking about the ethics administrator. That's where all the discipline parts of the code are and what actions I take and the procedures that are followed. 
I make a recommendation, I conduct an investigation using all those resources off the, the chart here that are available to me if I need them. Now, a lot of times I don't because on its face, I can look at a video or I can listen to an audio and tell that a violation's occurred. But I have all those resources. I then make a recommendation to the legislative auditor. So there's a checks and balance. I can't just go running after someone on my own. And right. in the case of a public censure, as we indicated before, I think, in the April meeting, in those, we also get the approval. They don't have a right to necessarily vote on it, but the approval of the Ethics Commission. But, but I would like to encourage a plateau date. I mean, just to say 90 days and then leave it depending on the severity. Oh, it should either be 120 days max or 200 days max or a year max instead of just saying 90 days pending severity. That's okay. an open-ended the reason is actually the maximum is for the term of office, but a minimum of 90 days is the recommendation of the Ethics Commission in terms of a public censure. If you've got to the point where you've received a public censure, there has to have been some severe conduct going on. But again, we wanted to live leeway just like we will review and uh, listen to whatever you have to say. Um, there may be extenuating circumstances that would make it appropriate to only be a 90 day as opposed to the term of office. Okay, and, I, and, and if that's what we're all gonna agree to, then that needs to be wrote in the language, 90 days into, uh, up to the, the okay. continuing term of office. Give me just a moment here. That is a summary, okay? The actual text of the code specifically says, um, well, let me find it here. <clears throat> Okay, what the actual proposed amendment says, um, a memorandum of public censure from the legislative auditor to the unified government representative shall be given to the unified government representative and cost be posted. Each such memorandum, once issued, shall remain posted on the unified government ethics website for a minimum of 90 days or up to and including the remaining duration of an elected or appointed official's term in office. So, I mean, it's clear in the code. I'm sorry, that's just a summary we put together for the PowerPoint. Okay. And that's something that I actually find a problem with. I think it's giving too much authority to the ethics department to be able to, to write up such a statute or put something on the website about a commissioner with um, the authority to extend it throughout their entire um, um, term in office. And so that's me personally. I don't know what the other commissioners think about it, but I think that's a little bit broad and vague. Um, but I'll move forward. Um, I also, when it, at the point where it speaks about permitted political activities, um, it has on there UG computers, uh, UG title, et cetera. Well, my question is, with us having a Surface computer that we carry around with us, which is still known as the property of the unified government, can you break that down a little bit? Because that could be come an issue. My understanding is, and again, this is based on, and I can go back and pull, or um, actually I think I got the opinion from uh, um, Jody Boding in the legal department, but my understanding is that the State Ethics Commission, the statute or the advisory opinion that they rendered was, you don't use, in this case, UG property, UG facilities, UG Facebook websites, that sort of thing. So I would think it would be included, but I'll defer to whoever. <laughs> Perhaps you could review that and offer an advisory opinion. Okay. Yeah, but the language of that was taken from the state advisory opinion. Okay. But the, the specific question about the surface. Yeah, that's about, been, it, about that's been checked surface. out to each of us, I think would be something that if you and the ethics commission could review, I think that would be. Is it, is it just, is it a computer or is it a phone or what? It's a what, tablet. A tablet, okay. I would say we probably would have the same question for employees, though, who have cell phones that we may have issued or other technological paraphernalia that we've issued through the unified government that they're also taking home or using. And right, and I know for, like, the, the commission, we receive a technology stipend, so we purchase our own phones. So our phones are our own use. The Surface, we do not purchase our own, ourselves. It's issued to us. And the question is, is it gifted to us or checked out to us. But I think that's something, I don't know that we need to resolve that tonight. Yeah, but we'll but if, you could if you could review that, I think that's a legitimate question to make sure we have clarity on. 
and 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 then I'm not finished. I still have one thing, and I and I and I want to say this, and um, and, and maybe you know, uh, County Auditor Tom Wiss may need to be at the podium or what not to speak. But I'm saying that an ethics administrator should have to have a certification and investigation, um, according to how the current ethics structure is set up. All complaints made against a commissioner are to be thoroughly investigated for validity. The individual should be certified to do such. If we are asking for people to be investigated, um, if we're allowing them the authority to put a sensor together that has information that from the supposed investigation, then that individual, in my opinion, should have some kind of certification and investigation. I'll speak to this. There's a sensor that was ran on me. And what was mentioned in the censor is that I had personalized tags with Commissioner District 4 on it. And it went on a censor and went out to the public. And all an investigator had to do was call the tags, the tag company, the, the, the people who issue our tags, and, 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 and look at it and say, has he ever had tags that said Commissioner District 4 on it? But instead of the investigator doing that, they just wrote it on a piece of paper and issued it to the public. And that's a concern and that's an issue because we have to be voted into office. And I just had that question. Yeah. And again, I think I've addressed it. First of all, I'm not going to get in debate the, the censure and the whole issue on the tag or anything else. But the whole point of the chart that I put up here and that's covered in all the training that each and every one of you have been in is I don't need a certificate. One, I don't know what a certificate of investigation quote is. But what I do have is a 35-year background in the legal field, in litigation, where I have tried over 100 two- to three-week cases where I had to lay foundation and put evidence in. I have an undergrad degree in investigative reporting and news editorial. So I think I've got the ability. But the point is, I don't need it, and my predecessor didn't need a certificate because I have every resource of talented investigators from our police department, from the fire department, from the uh, human resource department, all available to me. Well, I, I appreciate, so I I appreciate everything you have available to you. I appreciate the 35 years that you have an investigation. But when you issue an censor with inaccurate documents on a commissioner who has to be elected in the office, it should be verified and it should be confirmed, not put on a censor for the, for the world to see and it be inaccurate. Okay. And okay. I'm not going to dispute that yet. All right, Commissioner Merguia. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so, Ruth, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is more a question for um, Ken uh, Moore. I'll sit over um, here real quick. Is your microphone on? Yeah, it's on. I can't. Oh, there we go. OK. So Ken, you talked earlier about you looked into the state ethics versus local ethics. And in general, it appears to me that um, locally we've set more rules and regulations on the local level than on the state level, or at least we address a broader range of issues than what the state does. Correct. OK. Um, and I think that's good. Um, at the end of the day, though, um, the level of enforcement on whatever rules or how many ever rules are out there um what is the level of enforcement power of the state versus the local government well the state has no administrative enforcement authority or jurisdiction over local governments at all the, and the what does that mean in a regular person's language okay. not a lawyer <laughs> the state can't investigate you so the state can't investigate claims? No, they cannot receive complaints and, or investigate complaints of local level uh, government officials. Now, the, the laws are still there. And so if there's a violation of the law, what they, what they just refer to the district attorney or the attorney general, and they investigate. If they find a violation, they file a criminal prosecution against the elected official or employee. OK, but something that wouldn't necessarily be um, illegal but unethical, they wouldn't necessarily be able to investigate that, right? The state. Well, really, the state doesn't use the, I mean, and they talk about conflict of interest laws. So what those statutes are referred to, um, see, 
those statutes are for conflict of interest. I really, when I put, put ethics statutes, that's probably a misnomer because I'm just trying to compare them. Uh, we have an ethics code, so I, I just said ethics statutes. It's, it's really a conflict of interest. Okay, so I guess I'm not a lawyer, so I struggle with this a little bit. There's lots of terminology that I don't use on a regular basis. And those of you that are lawyers, because you know it, you speak very fast. So <laughs> let me see if I can slow this down. I guess what I care about in the end is we've set up all these rules, which I think are a great thing, okay? But if one of those rules are deemed to have been broken by Ms. Benin and the Ethics Commission, at the end of the day, what authority do we have to do anything about that other than tell them, I'll use myself. Um, I behaved badly, I shouldn't behave that way. Other than that, what other authority do you have? Well, the, the administrative enforcement authority that we have locally is, is conferred by the ethics code. You know, I mean, when you adopt a code, you, you set out what the, the penalty, well, what the violations are and what the penalties for those violations are. For elected officials, the, really the penalties for violations are either an informal or a public censure. For employees, it's different. If, if there's a, a if an employee violates the ethics code, after it goes, if the commission and the administrator, ethics administrator find that, they get the, the agreement of the legislative auditor, Mr. Wiss, and then they tell Mr. Bach. And then Mr. Bach imposes And what discipline. can Mr. Bach do to me? He can suspend you, he could fire you. You're an employee. I'm You're talking employee. about he elected officials. He can't do anything to you. I'm talking about elected officials. What actual authority does the, um, the, you have over the elected official? The, uh, the uh, informal, private, or public censure of an elected official. Right, so you basically write them up and you can either keep that private and warn them and say, you're violating these and no one else knows or you can make it public that they're violating them, that's Correct. it? Okay, just wanted to make sure. Um, and then um, I had another question for you. Oh, I do want to make a comment in regard to due process. Um, d did I understand it correctly that I understand we have due process for our employees, um, which means that if they don't like the ruling they're given by ethics, they can go to the HR department at the Unified Government and appeal that, correct? Well, the, uh, somewhat, yes. Uh, the, the difference is, is that if an employee violates the ethics code, they can be disciplined. If they're a member of a, a bargaining unit, a union, then the union contract outlines how that discipline is imposed and what their appeal rights may be by filing a grievance. Mm -hmm. For non-union employees, it's governed by the uh, human resource guide. And that guide has, has a list of, you know, uh, uh, I guess penalties, if you will, mm -hmm. subject to, you know, an informal reprimand all the way to termination, depending on the severity of it. And we have the, an employee would have the right to appeal that through the administrative processes, ultimately to the county administrator. Okay, and that's really more applicable to employment law, how you would handle that employee than anything else. Yeah, exactly, because it's really just a form of discipline and a violation of the ethics code subjects you to discipline. Okay, so now switching to due process for elected officials. Um, I know Commissioner Walker asked some questions about that. I wasn't, he's also a lawyer, and I'll remind you again, I'm not. He so. talks funny too. <laughs> yes. And so I, I'm not sure I completely understood that, um, that part of the conversation. But I, I will tell you, this is my two cents on that. Um, I do think elected officials are entitled to due process. We are public figures, and um, when people make public accusations that have not been investigated, um, I don't think that's fair to elected officials who put themselves out there already. I think they're entitled to a process. I believe it's also federal law that people are entitled to due process. Um, so I would hope that we would fix that um, and elected officials should be treated in exactly the same manner and 
as employees, not the same process, but they should be given due process. I just think that's respectful of anyone. If you're going to accuse someone of something, they should have the right to defend themselves. I mean, it's kind of the American way. It just would seem un-American to not have a due process for elected well, officials. There, there are, there's, there's two issues, really. One, one is due process, and then one is the right to appeal. And, and uh, kind of what I was talking about before, about the employee and the grievance, is kind of your appeal rights to, uh, to, to, uh, for the ultimate discipline, I guess. But due process is, is different because really the courts kind of find due process is an opportunity to hear the, the allegations against you and an opportunity to respond. And there's no magic way that's done. And so I think what Ms. Benin is saying is that that's why they give, they issue the, their uh, violation in writing and you have a chance to respond to that. They take your response into consideration and then they render their opinion. Now, so that's the due process part. And I think, I think uh, the courts would easily uh, uphold that as being adequate due process. The new question though is do you have a right to appeal? And I think what Ruth really was getting to is, is uh, you notice how I referred to the ad hoc committee? Because when the original consolidation study report came out, it had the, uh, the judges involved in appointing the ethics commission and, and, and the legislative auditor. And then lo and behold realized, well, they have no authority over the judges. And so they had, the judges had to voluntarily agree to, to, uh, to perform that function, which they've done in the district attorney. And so that's why they call it the ad hoc committee, because it's not a formal committee, because we can't do that. Okay. That, that last part's all really fast. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and I'm not sure I completely understand that, but I will tell you this. So you, so if, if I, let, let me walk through it slower. So if I, um, if I get a letter from Ruth that says I have done something wrong, I can respond to that in writing, explaining why I didn't think I did anything wrong. And then she can respond um, to that one way or the other. And that's what, what you think is, a pro, is due you process. believe the courts would uphold as due process. Correct. Can we get a judicial opinion on that? And not from Wyandotte County judicial system. Can we actually get an opinion from a court, either federal court or from a court outside of our local court, whether or not that would be um, appropriate due process. Uh, Ms. Mr. Walker wanted to respond to that. I, I would love for the circumstances to permit that, but unless the rules have changed, again, Judge Lamson, you're the chief judge. Judges cannot give advisory opinion absent a uh, case in controversy. So there would have to be a legitimate bona fide lawsuit and the outcome of that would be an opinion by a district court judge as to the question you just asked. So then can we, is there not, um, you all are the lawyers, so is there not a higher power to seek an opinion from? Like, do attorney generals give opinions? I believe in a higher power. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he's not writing back, Mayor. He's not writing back right now. <laughs> or she is not writing back, whichever. Um, uh, so I need someone that can write back. <laughs> and so is, I, I'm not sure, I really don't know the answer to this, but could an attorney general provide an opinion on that? Or a U.S. attorney, the U.S. attorney provide an opinion on that? The, um, my understanding is the attorney general will just, it, it will just issue advisory opinions on matters involving state law. And so, so in our UG ethics code is not a matter of state law. So I don't think that they would issue an advisory opinion as to whether that is due process. I mean, so you'd have to ask uh, your attorney and I'm sure she would agree with me. I mean, I, I think it's, I mean, I, there's, there's little doubt in I my mind the that that's question, satisfying. I guess the shorter question then, you as the attorney, you as our attorney up here at the Unified Government, as our attorney, um, as a commissioner, I'm telling you, I'm concerned about, uh, you say you think that would be upheld in court. Um, it, who certain. could we, uh, what would be your recommendation as our attorney to get um, an opinion on that? Com commissioner, can I make a recommendation? I mean, I think one of the issues is we have three people, the legislative auditor, 
the district attorney and the chief judge who are largely overseeing this process. And I would think that if the legislative auditor, the district attorney, or the chief judge thought that the ethics commission or the ethics administrator that they appointed were doing something in violation of the law, that they would address that. I trust the judgment of Chief, chief Judge Lampson and of our district attorney, Jerry Gorman, and of our legislative auditor, Tom Wiss, as three legal minds who um, have overseen this process and are continuing to watch it. Uh, Ms. Benin is also an attorney, and I also trust the judgment of our ethics commission. Um, so in terms of have legal minds looked at this, mercy, yes. And if our chief judge and district attorney and legislative auditor feel like this process is fair and just, that's enough for me. So um, I would tell you, I think we have a lot of legal minds that are local here from Wyandotte County that are looking at this. But um, I think the appearance that it presents is we are judging ourselves. So oftentimes um, in a legal case, if the judge knows the defendant or the plaintiff, they will recuse themselves from the case because they're familiar with those people. Um, it doesn't make that judge a bad person and it doesn't make um, any of those people bad people. When they're doing jury selection through Wadir, I believe it's called, um, if I was to stand up and someone was the defendant that I knew and say I knew them, I'm pretty confident they're not going to put me on the jury. And it doesn't mean that um, they think I'm a bad person or would not be impartial. The reality is, is that appearances are there. Um, and that's why the ethics um, rules were changed in the beginning, is that it wasn't that anything was being done wrong, allegedly. It was that um, appearances, it looked badly. So I'm just saying, I understand we have a lot of local good people, but the difference between governing locally is that this group of people is judging. The Ethics Commission are in essence judges, and the administrator of that is a judge. And I, nothing personal, I think they're doing a fine job but I think when it's coming to final judgment and there are discrepancies, I think it's very appropriate to seek an outside opinion from a qualified professional. So I'm asking you as our attorney, who would we ask for an opinion to make sure that it doesn't look I'll just ask you that, because I don't have the right word. <laughs> well, it's just an opinion, Ken. It, Nobody's going to get in trouble. Okay. Well, Unless, it, of mean, course, it's been wrong, then we might have trouble. But it's a it's a local uh, local regulation, you know, that's that you adopt, and so I don't really think that that uh, you know that there's any supervising or higher authority that would that would look over that and, and render an opinion I just, well I just but can't this is what i'm saying so you're asking me to judge myself i'll even tell you that's not fair i shouldn't be allowed to judge myself and may, i shouldn't be allowed to do that what i'm asking is that we're asking for an outside opinion with no bias people that don't live here people that don't send their kids to school here and have relation, political relationships. We're asking for a truly legal opinion. Amen. I guess I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not following. If you're, if you're asking for some outside uh, independent person, whatever, to, to determine the facts, determine whether or not a violation occurred, as opposed to the Ethics Commission who's appointed by the Ad Hoc Committee to do that, no, no. I think I think I think Miss Benin does a fine job determining what the facts are, and I really don't have any criticism of the Ethics Commission's um, review of the findings that Miss Benin does. I don't have any questions about that. I probably have not been very clear about that in the past. Well, I'm talking about at the end of the day, if 
if what we define as due process is really due process. Okay. The, and that's, yeah, um, Hal Walker would like to respond. I, I, I want <laughs> due process, um, I think is a word that, at least from my standpoint, is much overused and, and greatly misunderstood. Uh, and certainly, you don't have to take my word for it. You can go anywhere you want. It's simply notice and an opportunity to be heard. That's all due process is. Uh, you're not guaranteed a district court trial or a fe U.S. federal district court trial with all the trappings, motions, discovery, trial, a judge sitting up. That is not what is required to meet the constitutional requirement of due process. It is notice and an opportunity to be heard. It's that simple. And I guess what I would answer to you, Commissioner, is that as the Commission, we define by ordinance what due process is. There's nobody going to do the work for us. There's not going to be the U.S. Attorney. He's a political appointee. He might be a Republican and not like Democrats, or he might be a Democrat and not like our Democrats. The State Attorney General. He's not empowered with any greater wisdom than any other lawyer. He is just an elected public official. Uh, yes, he may not have any, any chips in the fire in Wyandotte County, but um, I am confident that among the district court judges, most of them, if not all of them, would give us an honorable opinion on an appeal of a decision. It's made by the agency. But if we want to find do, do, define due process as something more or something more elaborate, we can do that by ordinance. But as it now stands, it's simply notice to you of a violation and an opportunity to be heard before the decision is rendered. And it's not going to get any better than that because that, that's what the United States Supreme Court says is due process. Well and to kind of follow that up, I mean, there are almost, there's probably literally thousands of cases that talk about due process. And every one of them is, is fact specific to how, you know, what occurred in that particular situation. But the bottom line is just as Commissioner Walker indicated, you have notice of the violation and an opportunity to defend yourself before the decision was made. And I would point out that the question was raised in April and the ethics administrator and ethics commission came back with a recommendation to clarify due process is that right we have an amendment before us to clarify the due process that was a specific request made of this of this um, commission and it was specifically responded to in the presentation that they've made tonight and i, I so, want to so, emphasize and i'm not going to try to enter, I take my turn you can we can define this more stringently we can add more requirements to this but it won't be just a, applicable to us. It'll be applicable, it'd have to be applicable to employees and everyone affected. So how cumbersome do you want this to be? So, well, you can call it cumbersome. I call it our job and a very important job when we are, in, when we are judging people's reputation um, and when we're making judgments about how they perform their job if they're an employee. So I think what I like about this process is it's been very public and it's recorded. And we have a lot of attorneys that commissioners that are not attorneys are depending on for really good legal advice. So if there is no other higher power that out there um, that will respond, <laughs> um, that will respond in writing um, and tell us, give us an opinion on our due process. Got a whole book. Unless there is a lawsuit, then I guess that's, um, that's what we'll have to live with. And I'm content with that. Like I said, I just like the idea of being so transparent that when we set a process locally, that we are so open to doing the right and fair thing that we are willing to seek an outside opinion. And since I'm not an attorney or familiar, that familiar with the judicial process, I wouldn't know who to go to. I would like us to seek an opinion outside of ourselves. It's an expression I, that comes to mind. I feel like we're the fox watching the hen house. 
Um, it's, I don't know how else to put it. That's my very simplistic way of saying it. It may not be the case, but to some people it appears that way. And I'll go back to what I said in the beginning. The whole original disagreement on this ethics ordinance change was all around appearances. It wasn't around any wrongdoing being done. So if we are that concerned about appearances and transparency and openness and honesty, I'm just saying if there is a process out there that we could go through to evaluate our rules, I think that'd be great. If there's not, then there's not. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, any further items? Commissioner Murgy, any further items before I move no, on? No, I don't have any more. Commissioner Markley. So um, my biggest concern in this discussion is this sort of usual and customary language. And I wanted to take just a minute to give an example or two of why it's so difficult to look at the usual and customary language and say, yes, this falls within this or it doesn't. Not to um, interrupt you, Commissioner, but you should tell people you are an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean I understand you when you talk fast. <laughs> so... Um, it, you know, it is complicated, and it's particularly complicated, I think, because we're at a local level and because we spend more time out there being commissioners than we ever spend in here. I'm a commissioner out in the community many more hours a week than I'm a commissioner here in, in the chambers at meetings, and I think that's true for all of us up here. So I'll give a couple of examples, and I, I don't, these are just off the top of my head. They're things that I think all of us will see as similarities in what we've done. We're problem solvers for our community. That's what we do as commissioners. And some of us are more hands-on than others, but I think everybody can relate to, to the example I'm going to give. So you get a phone call from a constituent. It's a little old lady, and she says, the tree in my yard is dead, and it's hanging over my neighbor's yard. And so codes came out, and they gave me a ticket, and they told me I had to take the tree down. So I, I can't. I don't have any money. Commissioner, what will I do? And the little old lady's all upset, and she's crying. So you hang up the phone, and this is what I would do. I would call a guy that cuts down trees in my district, and I would say, I've got this old lady. She needs her tree cut down. She can't really afford it. What, how, what can you do for her? You know, how, how little can you cut it down for? Now, I wouldn't say that I was Commissioner Markley calling. The guy obviously knows I'm Commissioner Markley, and he knows that the lady called me in my role as Commissioner Markley. Was that a fundamental function of government? I don't know, but that's the kind of problems that we're solving every day. So to me it is, but I wonder if that's how other people look at this language when they see the words fundamental function of government. We problem solve like that every day. Those are the kind of issues that we're handling. And so I just wanted to say that out loud so that everybody who's listening to this here tonight can understand it's not that we're trying to make this complicated it's that it is complicated and that what you know ribbon cuttings are one thing I think everybody knows that a ribbon cutting as part of what we do as commissioners but helping the little lady with her tree I do a thousand times more often than I ribbon cut I ribbon cut once a month I help the little old lady with her tree every single day um, so it's it's it is a complicated issue, and it's not that I think we all go out there ringing the bell and saying, I'm a commissioner, do what I want. I'll give one other example. So when I go to vote, the people that are sitting there behind the table, they always say, hi, Commissioner Markley, and it always gives me a little bit of heartburn because even when I'm not on the ballot, I can feel other people in the room turn and look, and I'm th I know that they're thinking, is that lady on the ballot today? And if so, who is she? I know they're thinking that, and it always gives me a little bit of heartburn, but it's just another way we're commissioners all the time, and it doesn't matter if we say, if, it doesn't matter if I don't go in and say, hey, I'm Commissioner Markley here to vote. Everybody there knows that that's the role that, that I play. Um, so, like I said, I, I, I was neither here nor there as far as the language. I appreciate that you're trying to help us clarify. I really do appreciate it, but I just wanted to put out there the reasons why it's so complicated is because I think what people think of as the fundamental function of government is this, us sitting up here and voting on Thursdays, but what we're actually doing as commissioners is this is a very, very, very small part of it, and all the other parts are much more wishy-washy in terms of, of how that fits into this prestige of office section. So I know everybody up here, we, the reason we want a clarification is because we want to do the right thing, um, and this is a step towards that and giving us clarification, but it's still just very complicated to make that determination. Thank you. Commissioner Kane. Thank you, Mayor. Boy, am I glad there's more union workers and lawyers in Wyandotte County. Because if you weren't confused before, you are for sure confused now. 
You, you know what I wish that some of you would do, and I mean this, and, and it's a trip 60 miles away to drive to Topeka and talk to Carolyn Williams. She's the lady on the Ethics Commission, and she'll answer your questions as blunt and as straightforward, and you won't be there more than 20 minutes because I don't think you can take it. But what it would do, it might help clarify what these folks do because they're gonna, she'll tell you, here's my roles and responsibilities. I've done this. Here's my roles and responsibilities. And this is, you're telling me this is their roles and responsibilities. So you go back and you live with them. So I would ask that all of you that have questions, call her, drive up, visit her, don't take her lunch because she won't go. But, and, and ask these questions because she'll be able to give you an answer th th that these folks can't. And I think in, in certain cases, that's what we need. We need somebody else telling us, this isn't, you think it's broke, it's not broke. Because if you compare us to some of the other cities, it's broke. And, and, and that's my request. You know, uh, that's where you drop off your, when you turn in your uh, expenditures and stuff like that, when you fax them or whatever, and I don't remember the phone number, I wish I did, but I wish you folks with questions would please call them because it might help. Commissioner Walker. Um, I think Commissioner Kane is correct. I think, and I, I again, will hedge, but we're one of the few cities, counties, that have anything like the ethics code. Um, when I have spoken with other city attorneys in the past, um, of course, they're under the campaign laws and the state state law insofar as it applies, but their, uh, their uh, elected officials uh, have not seen fit for whatever reason to adopt such a uh, series of provisions. Um, an issue of particular interest to me that I don't see addressed in here concerns nepotism. And <clears throat> that is a big animal in Wyandotte County, always has been, and I'm not going to try to wrestle that bear to the ground. But when it comes to the unified government elected officials, there's already a somewhat of a prohibition on nepotism. Does that, are we prohibited, and I want to emphasize this word hypothetically, if I wanted to appoint my wife to a board, I don't see a provision that would prohibit me from putting her name into that hopper for say planning commission or <laughs> any one of the, the, the committee commissions or agencies. Is that correct? <laughs> well I believe that it is. And <clears throat> I'm not I don't know if any of my colleagues here at this table have appointed a brother, sister, mother, father, wife to any agency or board. My husband was on the law enforcement advisory board when I came in and I reappointed him eventually, although he's not now. But, but you didn't appoint him. She reappointed him. She reappointed him. Oh. I could be wrong. It, he was on when I came. In answer to the question, the current code section specifically only relates to no person shall be employed by the unified government if that person, spouse, child, sibling, or parent is either the mayor or one of the UG commissioners. We it have had a talk about we have had a commissioner in the past who appointed their son to the planning and zoning commission, but it was we not also a paper had them that appointed their father and uh, mother. And uh, all right, well, I don't want to get entangled with this issue, but I think at some point this this is this to me. There should be a prohibition on that within a certain relationship. I would ask, I think that's a fair request for the Ethics Commission to consider for a future provision um, to look at the issue of appointments to boards in terms of relationships, even though they're non-paid. The other interesting nuance I would ask you to explore, and Commissioner Walker, I, I think it's the appearance of impropriety that we're trying to avoid. Technically, we don't appoint people 
we recommend appointment for, and the commission appoints. And so it's a little different nuance, but I, I think it is a legitimate appearance issue that I think the Ethics Commission could wrestle with and give us a recommendation on. I think that's a valid issue. Commissioner Maddox. Thank you, um, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to, you know, say this as I heard Commissioner Kane speak about calling uh, Carolyn Williams at the state level. I have spoke with Carolyn Williams uh, at the state level, and I encourage every commissioner uh, on the board of commissioners to call and speak with Carolyn Williams. And I think that conversation lasted um, less than five minutes. And what she simply told me was that we didn't need a local ethics department. And I ain't lying on the record. She said we didn't need a local ethics department. And she said it was a breeding ground for authority problems. And as I sit here and listen, it's going to continue to be an issue because it seems that the ethics department is in place to make sure that we don't overstep our authority. And now we as a commissioner sounding out and saying, well, we want to make sure that the ethics department doesn't overstep their authority. And so maybe this will continue to be an argument that we just pass on to, to future commissions. But that continues to be an issue. But I encourage, as Commissioner Kane did, every commissioner to call Carolyn Williams at the state level so she can tell them the same thing she told me. Commissioner Walters. I wasn't going to bring up nepotism, but since Commissioner Walker did, uh, <laughs> I thought I'd throw in my request. I, it sounds, I, I'm reading this uh, section 2-266, and um, it seems to indicate that nepotism is a bad thing. And it specifically says that certain people should not be hired if they're related to the, the mayor or the Unified Board of Commissioners or the administrator. My question is, how did the, how did, did the uh, Ethics Commission come up with that small group of people who should not uh, participate in nepotism but leave so many other senior employees able to do so? That's my question. I've been nominated. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations. The, uh, the Ethics Commission, I think what they're doing is they're working with the code in the form that it's in, and so they're just kind of they're tweaking well, that's the it, way it's been. Yeah, and that, that's the way the commission back in 1998 adopted the Ethics Code. Are, are there other people, though, to your question, are there other people by virtue of the Human Resources Guide that are not allowed to be hired within departments. Are you aware of that? Outside of the ethics, I wonder if there's human resources issues. No, we don't have any further hiring restrictions. Oh, no. direct, yeah, direct supervisors yes. over that. You cannot directly supervise. Well, I, I would like just maybe a quick review of that. There are a lot of other elected officials beyond those that are listed here that uh, I guess are, it's okay for them to participate in nepotism. So I think you know maybe it would just be uh, worthwhile to review that, and I request that the Ethics Commission do so. The request is noted to review other issues of nepotism of other elected officials or even administrators. Yes. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Merguia. So based on Commissioner um, Kane and uh, Commissioner Maddox's comments, I wanted to make a comment in regard to speaking with this Carolyn Williams, who I have never spoken with um, personally. Um, this, uh, so I don't really have a strong opinion one way or the other. I don't mind the Local Ethics Commission. Um, I wouldn't mind if we used a, a different form of ethics. I do think we need a form of ethics um, that is set out in writing here. Um, so the process is really irrelevant to me. I guess what still remains concerning to me, and I really want to say this on the record, is the harsh resistance to having anybody outside of ourselves review our ethics ordinances. I don't understand that. So it just continues to be nobody's going to review this outside 
And with all due respect, Ms. Benin and I, I think, have a good relationship, but Ms. Benin lives here in Wyandotte County. All of the ethics commissioners, good people, they also live in Wyandotte County. And I guess if there isn't, and our judge lives here, and I guess if there is nothing wrong with the way we're admitting, administering things, or maybe not even that it's wrong, just maybe ways that it could be done better, I just am unclear about the resistance to a second opinion on that. Um, I, I would ask, and I think the Ethics Commission could review this on our behalf, to review what's usual and customary for communities that have adopted ethics, ethics policies. My understanding is all local communities adopt their own ethics policies and the processes therein. Um, as because they're not covered under state law and they're unique, I think it could be there could be a look at other communities. Does someone else have a, a check and balance? I mean, we have a number of multiple check and balances within our community. Um, I mean, we've got eight people over here, nine people over here um, who are citizens in our community. But um, I mean, if you want, I think we can ask them to look at what's usual and customary. But I think what's usual and customary is that we adopt our own we adopt our own process. Um, based on the recommendation of this independent panel. So unless somebody else has a, a suggestion, I mean, we could ask the Ethics Commission to review that. Commissioner McKiernan. Well, I may have already started to do some of that work for us because what I heard that no other city had an ethics commission. It might be no other city in Kansas, but I took a look at Kansas City, Missouri, San Diego, California, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Boston, Massachusetts, Seattle, Washington, Denver, Colorado, and Miami, Florida, which is Miami-Dade. And of all of those, each one of those cities has its own city ethics commission and code, and I have all the websites and everything here, and each of them, to the best of my ability to interpret the information, um, has authority over not only employees, but also elected and appointed officials as well. And I'm sorry, I, m I misspoke. Of all of those, everyone has a local city ethics commission and code, except Boston, Massachusetts, and they specifically say that the Massachusetts State Ethics Commission has jurisdiction over state, county, and municipal employees, whether elected or appointed, paid or unpaid, full-time or part-time. And so they specifically set out that the state of Massachusetts has that authority. So I think, um, and I even have a summary chart, and I think we could look at some of these and imagine that, a summary chart. But I, I think it's inaccurate to say that other cities don't have it, because certainly in my brief uh, survey of other cities around the country, and I tried to pick west coast, east coast, and right down the middle, that I found examples of cities that in fact do. Now, how they do it is amazingly disparate. They, who appoints the Ethics Commission, how they're appointed, for what term, how many there are, is amazingly varied. Um, but in fact, I did find evidence that lots of other cities do, and I think that that could be a starting point for us to do some additional investigation. Thank you. Commissioner Walker. Um, <clears throat> again, I, I don't want the point lost. Number one, I'm 99% confident that we have a avenue of appeal, not only the commissioners, but employees. Oh, you've been requested to speak into the microphone, please. We have an avenue of appeal as, as elected officials and, and, for that matter, employees to the district court. The district court are, I mean, I, they're out, as outside of, of, of politics as you can be in a county that won't allow them to be appointed and retained as opposed to having to run for election because the people have repeatedly said, we want to choose our own judges. So there the people have spoken about what the judicial process shall be. I also believe that what I'm trying to get across to, to everyone is, is that we can define what due process is. We define the ordinances that the Ethics Commission operates under. And clearly not everyone at this table is happy with the way it has been cast, which is minimally just notice and an opportunity to be heard. So there are approaches that can 
put more safeguards into the process. I'm not opposed to that. And yes, it is more, the word is correct, cumbersome, because it will take longer for the process to be followed in every case. There'll be more work and probably more involvement of the ethics administrators, so there are other considerations. But we can define what due process is. And I'm sure that the legal minds that are involved in this, from the district court judge to the Ms. Benin to the legal department, can come up with ways in which these issues or concerns can be satisfied. Uh, I'm, I'm frankly, you know, I don't, I, I don't know that I would be any more comfortable if we plucked five people from Johnson County to decide the fate of all of us in Wyandotte County. I think I would have problems with that. So I'd rather, Amen. Uh, I'd rather trust the local people and I've not seen any signs to believe that there's shenanigans going on. And if there is, I would have reported it. So that's how I feel about it. I, I, I am not opposed to making it a little bit more intensive in terms of what has to be done before a, a decision is reached okay. and safeguarding the employee and the elected official from their reputation being damaged. All right, so what I have is um, the, I have three things, a right to appeal, um, to review whether or not the state law allows right to appeal, and to come back to us with that information. I've heard a request for review of nepotism, not only among appointments to boards and commissions, but also um, about other electeds or administrators. Um, for hire. So I, I think that's another um, piece that's been requested. Um, I think there, what, what I would recommend at this point is that we take the recommendations today, and the legal team said, I think it was Mr. Moore who said, I didn't draft them as ordinances to adopt because I wanted to get the feedback from the commission tonight first so he didn't have to do it twice. I think that's fair. Um, I think the majority of what has been presented tonight um, I think that we've heard feedback on, we've had the presentation. I think we're ready to move that towards the ordinance stage and with the caveat of the remaining issues um, that have been left. And it will, I presume it will take our legal team a little bit of time. Um, I don't know if you can have it done by the end of this week. Um, I think we will give them, I will work with the administrator to assign ample time to our legal team to draft the appropriate ordinances for this uh, to bring back to this commission for a formal vote in the future. And of course, you will be noticed as to when that formal vote will be taken. Um, so are there any other questions at this point um, before we close this discussion? All right, I wanna thank everyone. I wanna thank the commission, the Ethics Commission for being here and for your work. I wanna thank uh, Ms. Benin and Judge Lampson and Mr. Wiss and uh, Mr. Gorman in his absence and certainly uh, Kenny Moore you've done a, a yeoman's job and yeoman's job in getting this pulled together but I want to thank all of you for your hard work and thank this commission for the consideration tonight. We are adjourned. <laughs>